name the soul Bible as I want to live its day. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man to see. Take your Bibles or change with me to Matthew 24. Truth is determined by the test of time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Basic Bible Study. This morning we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark. This is the first in a series on that Gospel. And we will get to that here really quickly. <clears throat> I am Brother David, and I'm going to be your host and fellow student for the next 30 to 45 minutes or so and I hope we don't go over and let's get started with this Jesus lived almost 2,000 years ago but even today people all over the world serve him we know this man primarily through four Bible books that is the four Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke and John first hand acquaintance with these writings will help us understand Jesus and his message we're going to survey in the next several lessons Mark's narrative of Jesus' life. As we study each lesson, please keep your Bible at your side so that you can verify what you are learning and what I am saying by the Scriptures. You will notice that Mark is divided into 16 chapters, and each chapter contains small divisions called verses. A couple of items before we get started. To profit most from these lessons, you need an open heart to receive what Jesus taught and did. Allow his words to direct you as you read. A prayer for God's guidance at the beginning and end of each study is recommended. If you don't understand something mentioned in this series or in your reading of Mark, please feel free to write your question down and send it to us along with your completed... Excuse me... <laughs> Please feel free to write your lesson down and send it to us, and we'll be happy to answer if we can. Send it to Empty Cross Ministries, all one word, at yahoo.com, and we will get to it and answer your question. And let's go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and I'm going to be reading from the King James Version, and we will get there here in just a moment. <laughs> As soon as I pull this, as soon as I pull it up. Alright, Mark 1, verses 1 through 8, beginning in verse 1. And again, I'm reading from the King James Version. You don't have to use that version if you don't want to. Use whatever version you can understand and relate to. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, beginning in verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness, and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and all were baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locust and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Excuse me. There we go. Okay. In the very first verse, Mark announced that he would write about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is surprising, therefore, that he did not start out by telling about Jesus himself. Instead, he described the work of John the Baptist. This was because John was to prepare the way for Jesus. John fulfilled this mission by preaching to get people ready for the coming of the Lord. John's message focused on two themes that will help us get ready to receive Christ. First, he preached about repentance. To repent means to change, to decide to change. 
John was telling his hearers that they had to reverse their life's direction to get ready for Christ. Those unwilling to change could not come to him. Second, John declared the greatness of Jesus. He said Jesus was so great that he himself was not even worthy to stoop down and untie his shoes. This was an amazing declaration because one does not have much worth to untie somebody's shoes. In fact, in John's day, untying shoes was considered to be a slave's lowest duty. John was not worthy to be Jesus' humblest slave. So for us to be ready to receive Jesus, we must repent, change our lives, and recognize his awesome greatness. Now let's go to Mark chapters, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was, the wild, and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered unto him. Now after that John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew and his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook, forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were also in the ship mending their nets. Just like the thousands of others, Jesus came to John to be baptized. But as he emerged from the water, something startling occurred. The Holy Spirit came, da came down upon him in the form of a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God was showing his approval of Jesus in a dramatic way. Then Jesus entered the wilderness where the devil tempted him. While Matthew and Luke provide more specific information about the temptation, look at Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. Mark's brief account shows two things. First, Jesus experienced temptation as all men do. Second, doing what pleases God as Jesus did when he was baptized does not exempt one from temptation. Satan often intensifies his, effort, his efforts when a person begins to serve God. As Jesus walked along, he saw two of his friends, Peter and Andrew, who were professional fishermen. He asked them to follow him and become fishers of men. At once, they quit their jobs and began following Christ. His next found, he next found James and John and requested that they do the same. With no hesitation, they left not only their occupation, but also their father and began to accompany the Lord. Clearly, these men recognized Jesus' greatness. He was the one whose shoes John was unworthy to untie. God had specially acknowledged him by his own voice from heaven. So when Jesus demanded radical action to drop everything and follow him, they responded immediately. What are the characteristics of, following, of followers of Jesus? What are the characteristics of followers of Jesus? Those fishermen demonstrated the meaning of discipleship. When Jesus called, they, number one, they acted immediately. Secondly, they left both job and family. And thirdly, they started following him. Christ calls today through his word. When we perceive his greatness, we too will, first of all, obey immediately all he says. Secondly, put him ahead of everything, including our job and family. And thirdly, follow him allowing his example to direct every step. People who know that Jesus wants them to change but put it off are not like these four fishermen. Now let's go to Mark chapter 1 verses 21 through 28. 
and they went into Capernaum. And straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Jesus' teaching astounded the multitude in the synagogue. A synagogue was like a church among the Jews. He taught with authority. He issued his commands as if his right hand, as if he had the right to tell others exactly what to do. Jesus' actions showed that he really had the authority that he claimed. In this paragraph, he cast out a demon. How? By his words. Nothing more. When Jesus merely said, Be quiet and come out of him, the demon left the man. His words had authority, even over demons. The calmness with which Jesus expelled demons reflected his power. He never argued or struggled or created a scene. He simply ordered the demons to leave, and they left. No wonder people were amazed. He had demonstrated the credentials to prove his authority. In every area, authority is essential. To determine distance, it is necessary to have a yardstick or standard of measure by which to calculate length. Thus, if someone wishes to know how long a room is, he measures it. There is no other way to know for sure. God has provided a yardstick in religion. Jesus and his words, when we wish to know whether something is right or wrong, we should evaluate it by the standard of scriptures. This should be done with every teacher and teaching, even what I'm saying right now throughout this series. Therefore, you need to have a Bible at your side while you are studying and continually refer to it to be sure that what is taught in these lessons is true. The Bible is our yardstick. Let's go to uh, verses 29 through 34. And forthwith they were come out of the synagogue. They entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. At, and at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and then that were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. Jesus came into Simon Peter's house and found his mother-in-law sick in bed with a high fever. We also see this in Luke chapter 4, verse 38. He spoke to her, raised her up, and the fever left her. She then began waiting on Jesus and the disciples. He also healed many others who were brought to him. Several features of Jesus' healings are noteworthy. He healed immediately with no delay. He healed everyone who came to him regardless of their disease. He healed so completely that Simon's mother-in-law was able to get up and start waiting on them. After a fever breaks, it normally takes a few days for a person to recover his strength. Jesus' healings put people back as if they had never had their, mal their maladies in the first place. Jesus sought to avoid publicity. He ordered the demons not to announce who he was. Now let's go to verses 35 through 39. <clears throat> and in the morning... Rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. 
And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. Jesus frequently sought solitude for prayer. prayer. Prayer during the daytime was nearly impossible since the crowds continually pressed on him. So he skipped sleep to be able to talk with his father that he missed so much. After finally finding him that morning, the disciples reported that everybody in the town where he had been was seeking him. Nevertheless, since he wanted to be able to get the message to as many people as possible, he insisted on moving on to the other towns. Now let's go to uh, Mark chapter 1 verses 40 to 45. This is where Jesus heals a leper. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. Painful open sores caused everyone to dread leprosy. Those who contracted it were quarantined because the disease was highly contagious. In this account, Jesus did what no one else dared to do. He touched a leper. When he did so, the man was healed immediately. His sores were instantly transformed into smooth skin. The Lord then instructed the cleansed leper to report his healing to the priest, a requirement of the law of Moses. Look at Leviticus chapter 13 through 14. But to tell no one else. The man, however, went out and told everyone the exact opposite of what Jesus had said. Undoubtedly, he was thrilled that he had healed, that he had been healed, and probably imagined that spreading the news about Jesus would honor him. But the fact remains that he did just what Jesus had said not to do. As a result, the Lord was thronged by such large crowds that he could no longer publicly enter into cities. He had to remain in unpopulated areas. We should learn a lesson here. All disobedience, even well intentioned, hurts Jesus' work. Let me say that again. All disobedience, even well intentioned, hurts Jesus' work. This chapter shows the greatness of Jesus. John was unworthy to untie his shoes. God spoke from heaven, endorsing him. He expelled demons by a mere word. He healed the sick immediately, regardless of the nature of their infirmity. This chapter also indicates how we should respond to his greatness. Immediately obey everything he says, no matter what sacrifice is required. Respect the authority of his message and obey him, even when his command seems unreasonable. That concludes the lesson for for this week. And let's close out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that guides us, gives us encouragement, and strengthens us in our times of weakness. Father, it shows us that we must obey your commands, even when we think they will require sacrifices that we can't make. Even when we think the command is unreasonable, Father, we must obey to honor you. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in our place, to take upon him our sins and the consequences of those sins that we have done. Father, there are no words 
to express our gratitude of thanks for that compassionate act. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay tuned next week. I don't know what time we'll be on, but we'll be in the second chapter of the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> and we will settle down here sometime in the next few weeks on a time to air this broadcast. Stay safe. Be blessed. Stay in the Word and write the Word upon your heart. Once again, if you didn't understand, write your question down. Send it to Empty Cross Ministries at yahoo.com and we will do our best to answer your question if we can. Again, stay tuned next sun next Wednesday at some time during the day. They claim the soul Bible as as what lived its day. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man to see. Make your Bibles or a turn with me to Matthew 24. Truth is determined by the test of time.